and palace traditions live on in some of the pleasures of the place. My friend Jem Mansour, great conductor, is uh, going to demonstrate how to make a woman's thigh meatballs. Sorry. Well, woman's thigh, yes, there's so many uh, dishes in Ottoman cuisine here. There's the vizier's fingers and the, and the lady's fingers and the, the, the beauty's lips. Oh, and no. It goes on and on like this. And, uh, that tells you anything about sexual uh, repression in the harem or otherwise. Mine, okay. All good fiction comes from tension. And Istanbul, in that sense, is the perfect setting for a crime novel. The crossroads of two oceans, a turnstile between two continents. Strange currents crackle here like lightning in a bottle. It's a rich, sensual world of smells and tastes, a cornucopia of colour and mouth-watering promise. These spices alone, sold in dazzling profusion in the Egyptian bazaars, are drawn from all over the Mediterranean and Middle East, used today just as they were in Yashim's time. One of the things I really love about Istanbul, and which I think makes it perfect for storytelling, is that behind the great grand facade, you know, the, the, the fabulous public monuments, the great mosques, palaces, and so on, lies this very workaday city. It's there, it's sometimes in the, as it were, the sort of belly of the city that you can find these grace notes of Ottoman culture and remains of the old city that the Yashim would have known. I'm lucky because for all its modernity, and Istanbul is a modern metropolis, the city still retains a powerful flavour of Yashim's Istanbul. So Jason, before you became a novelist, you actually uh, wrote some fair history, actually some very good history. I particularly recall Lords of the Horizon which is a book I absolutely loved. Um, when I was an undergraduate at Stanford, I wrote a senior thesis on the strategic importance of the Turkish Straits to the Russians who had been longing for a warm water port. Yep. <laughs> and part of yeah. that, bizarrely enough, is the Stanford Church is famous for its mosaics. And there was a chaplain whose life work it was to tell undergraduates all about mosaics. So that kind of left me with a lifelong interest in Byzantium, yeah. mosaics. Just recently been to Venice, Ravenna, and the beautiful island of Torcello, where wow. some of the great mosaics are located. Yeah. Yeah. So I gravitated to your book, like, you know, mm. swam right up to it. <laughs> what got you interested? Gosh, I mean, um, in a way, it's an echo of, what, of, the, of, of your approach, really. I think, um, you know, a long time ago, when I was at school, uh, and we studied, among other things, the poetry of W. B. Yeats, a great Irish poet. And he had a phase in his life where he was very interested in mysticism, theosophy, and so on. And one of the facets of that was that he became very convinced that at one point in history, actually in the 6th century, sometimes, sometime around then, 6th century AD, Byzantium, this city that we're talking about, Istanbul, the city of Constantinople, had that civilization, which was Greek and Christian, and yet was also a, was a continuation of the Roman Empire itself, had in some way become a sort of mystical, they had succeeded in achieving some sort of mystical fusion of thought and feeling, um, which attracted him immensely. And he wrote wonderful poems about, about it. There's a famous one called Sailing to Byzantium. There's a movie out right now called uh, No Country for Old Men. Right. That line, No Country for Old Men, is a quote from that poem. Um, uh, that is no country for old men, the young in one another's arms, birds in the trees, and so on. He talks about the mosaic and things, and he tries to, I mean, for an for a, you know, adolescent boy, this is quite heady stuff. And, and I, I just had this already, was beginning to create this uh, sort of fantastic picture in my head of this dr sort of dreamy city. You know, it was both a credible fusion of, thing, of, of past and yet existed now. And so on. When I went up to Cambridge I don't know, a couple of years later, um, I got the opportunity to do some Byzantine history and to study some of that. And we particularly did work on, just like you, you know, on the mosaics and on the art and so on. Uh, 
and I sort of fell in love with this place. You know, it's an ex it is an extraordinary place, and that's you know, it is the junction between Asia and Europe, standing on the Bosphorus, which is the the waterway that cuts through from the Black Sea to the Mediterranean, and you know what. What a what a junction! What a place! Um, and so when I say in that in that little movie that this is the center of the world, I mean there's, that's what I mean. I mean it's a, it, many people uh, you know over, over many many centuries have said the same. You know this is the place destined to be the center of the earth. That's what they feel because it's such an extraordinary junction. So I did this, I did this other this other work, this university stuff, and um, and then and then a few years later this opportunity arose to. To go and visit, actually go to the city. You know, travel not wasn't as easy then as it, as it would be now. I, mean, I guess now you just get a cheap ticket and off you go. But that would have spoilt it. And the idea of going to this place was already beginning to become a sort of phantasm in my imagination. Really, um, the idea of just sort of you know get on a plane, get off a plane. Oh, there we are. It, we're right. in Istanbul. We're at the airport. Yeah, right. the airport. You know, check your bags. And it would have just kind of undercut the whole sort of romance of it. So um, I came up with a very <laughs> odd way of doing it, which was a kind of pilgrimage. And uh, I decided to walk there. And we were going to walk, couldn't walk from, from England, because you know, we couldn't walk on water. But we started off in, in northern Poland. We took a ship to the Baltic. And we got off and just got to Gdansk, um, famous place of um, you know, the shipyard rebellion against communism began. And the whole thing began there, really. And this was 1990. It was just after the wall had fallen. The year after everything had, had changed in Eastern Europe, and we walked through Eastern Europe every day, you know, 20 miles, 25 miles, whatever, staying with with people on the way, just knocking on doors and saying, "Could we sleep in your barn or whatever?" And going behind these great cities and moving through the countryside, and, you know, it was it was a great experience. I mean, it was a really extraordinary thing, um, and it was a you know, I suppose we saw just the end of you know European peasant life, which was had been curiously enough sort of preserved by communism. And as we approached, as we got further south, you know, you could tell something was changing. Something was changing in the smells and the scents and the, in, in, the, in the flavors of things. You know, coffee appeared, you know, really good coffee. Um, really colorful people, gypsies wearing wonderful costumes, you know, beautiful uh, printed cottons, great skirts. Uh, Stylish people, you know. I mean, Poland's a lovely country, and, and uh, you know, I'm a I'm a great fan of the Poles. And in fact, I have um, that's something I you know I have a great Polish character in you the do. stories. Um, but you know, color and style isn't perhaps <laughs> what they're most noted for, uh, and particularly not in 1990. And suddenly, this this feeling that we were marching to a different beat. You know, this wasn't about Berlin and St. Petersburg and great empires clashing across the sort of northern European plain. It was something else, and and it was coming out of Istanbul. This color, this, 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 you know, the people were, were responding to another, to this other place, and that was terribly exciting. And, you know, we arrived. We arrived in Istanbul. I went with, th I went with uh, two other, two friends, um, one of whom is now, um, you know, mother of my children, and we've been together since then, and the other one I haven't spoken to for 17 years. Ah, well, journeys <laughs> test, do they not? So you came into Istanbul from the north, so yeah. to speak, and so you came over the land route. Yeah. Um, and then you would have you would have seen the the ancient city walls that yeah. were designed to because it had great sea defenses, but it did sure. need at some point. Um, yeah, it had oh, it has huge great walls. I mean, these are amazing walls as well. I mean, they're built right. in the sixth cent and sort of added to. But I mean, they're, the, they're es in essence they're built in the sixth century. I mean, that's one of the things about Istanbul is just so mind blowing. I mean, like Jerusalem, I suppose it's it's it is so ancient, and what's there is is so magnificent. I mean, the, I think the greatest building in the world is in Istanbul, which is the Hagia church Sophia. of Hagia Sophia, yeah. And was, isn't it fascinating? The thing that just knocked me out was that you stood, and on your right was Hagia Sophia, which is the center, really, of Greek Christianity. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think there's some agitation about trying to make it something like the Vatican, although it's right. a museum now. Yeah, so, yeah. And on your left is the beautiful blue, mm. you know, the mosque. The blue mosque, yeah. The blue mosque. And my husband and I were there at the end of our, of our sailing trip from Istanbul to Athens and back as Ramadan began. Mm. And it was absolutely fascinating, you know, to be, mm. and he's Jewish, and I'm Episcopalian, so mm. here we were, right, as you say, yeah. sort of in the navel <laughs> of, you know, of all of this. And it was the most extraordinary experience.